it or spoken with. Uh, I work with CII and we are handling the back end and uh, the economy department over here. Uh, I would request all panelists who are uh, who have a video as well as an audio button with yourselves to please be on mute while the conversation is on. You can definitely put your questions up in the chat box or raise your hand if you have a question and Noshak will call you out. When Noshak calls out your name, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. This is just to ensure that we have a better flow of things. Uh, with those words, I think uh, I'll hand it over to Noshak and when Mr. Ghosh comes in, we will take him on. Uh, uh, thank you, and take over. Sure. So, uh, good good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, good morning, Abhijit. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we truly have a treat, I think, uh, for all of us today. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, this is Abhijit CI's one twenty fifth year, uh, so we're celebrating. We started in in Calcutta uh, 125 years ago uh, as a small engineering association, which merged with another engineering association somewhere along the way, uh, which then morphed into yet a different organization, then moved uh, some years ago, about 50 years ago to Delhi. Um, and then it, when it merged with, a, with, a, with another organization, um, became at that time the Association of Indian Engineering Industry then became the Confederation of Engineering Industry and then uh, CAI. Um, so uh, uh, one of the ways that we're celebrating our 125th anniversary uh, is by launching uh, uh, a lecture series and interaction uh, with thought leaders, people who can uh, provide us with ideas and direction uh, for what we hope will be the next 125 years. And I can think of no one better than you to do that for us, Abhijit. Uh, we're truly privileged to have you uh, with us this evening and uh, morning for you and uh, uh, greatly look forward uh, to this, uh, this session. Uh, what we've, what the format that we're uh, planning to follow is that um, after a couple of minutes, I'm gonna request Abhijit to say uh, a few words. He particularly did not want to give a long uh, speech. Uh, so say a few words. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll go into uh, a Q&A where I'll ask Abhijit some questions, uh, really trying to draw him out on, uh, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, um, on, a few, on a few topics that are of great concern uh, to us in India, to us in Indian industry, but I think to the world more generally today. Um, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A from the floor. Um, so with, let me make just one comment as an introductory comment. Um, you know, we, one of the most overused words in, uh, 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 around is unprecedented. But if there's one time when unprecedented applies, it's at the present time. Uh, the health crisis that we face is unprecedented in its uh, spread. Um, it's pretty well in every country worldwide. It's unprecedented in the uh, percentages of the population in each of these countries that is being affected by it. It's unprecedented in the way in which countries have reacted to the spread of the infection by imposing lockdowns, a word that I, 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 like everyone else, had never heard of until three months ago, uh, four months ago, um, and imposed them with varying degrees of stringent, stringency. Um, and it's unprecedented in the impact that these lockdowns have then had on the economy uh, in terms of stopping things dead uh, in, uh, in many respects. And unprecedented also uh, in the huge suffering that has resulted uh, from the imposition of this lockdown, uh, certainly uh, in our own country, uh, and especially affecting people who are uh, amongst our most vulnerable. So unprecedented really applies. Uh, 
at this uh, at this point in time and i think there's no one better than uh, you abhijit to uh, be our guide at these in these unprecedented times because you know you have this mastery of theory but you've never if i may say so you've never let your mastery of theory um come in the way of having your feet on the ground and understanding what makes people do what they do um as economic actors as human beings and therefore what it takes to deliver a better life to people to each individual and i think the this this ability to combine you know a mastery of theory a mastery of all the literature with a real micro understanding of what makes people tick and what makes a difference to human beings at the end of the day uh, is truly unique and uh, we are very fortunate indeed uh, to have you with us uh, this evening so with those uh, initial comments let me end with a qu- with a question uh, which may be a good lead into you which is given this unprecedented situation that the world finds itself in that india finds itself in um what's your what's your view of the next 12 months or so uh what to you would be good uh 12 months out if you were able to say if this happens in the world if this happens in india 12 months out you would be a happy man and uh, uh we as a, a world would be in a better place over to you abhijit thank you that was very 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 kind and uh, and uh, hello to everyone um it's i very much insisted that i don't want to uh give a speech because i think i think the other word that goes with unprecedented is unexplored we we really absolutely are in a in a place where in my view we know I don't think I've ever been in a place where I know so little about the enormous Im- Im- imponderables that are going to any any answering any questions. Everything we'll say uh, here, me certainly, but I suspect uh, all of us will be speculative. It just is is a little bit beyond comprehension. What's happened? For example, I just start to the economy. i think the fact that everything has been stopped in the trap what does it that even mean does it mean that people are accumulating savings that uh, which they are preparing to spend the moment they can are they decumulating savings because, because they don't have any source of income what's the net net effect of that uh, it seems to me that both are happening to some extent uh, but, but i think the impact of the opening will depend very much on which of these forces dominate and um again it it depends a bit on on people's expectations i think people will need to if people are very pessimistic they should hold on to their savings if people are very pessimistic they should uh, they should uh, they will not expect to find employment uh, therefore they will then uh not for example leave their all the migrants who gone back to uh bengal bihar or up are going to stay there because they're going to say they think that this is go this is all you know uh going to come back again and again and if so they will not come back we we have no idea of of to ex- what extent this has damaged confidence for example and i think that confidence is going to be a key to whatever happens will depend on 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 people's confidence in our collective ability to neg- negotiate this moment that's on the economic side on the on the epidemiological side i think we are equally if if not even less uh informed i don't think again um, not sure this as nosha said this is unprecedented 
the flu epidemic of 100 years ago is mentioned often, but when it's mentioned in a context where there was no, uh, in some ways it, we were much more passive. But now we're trying to do things, we're trying to do things that are um, good, bad, uh, but at least we're, we're, we're sort of not uh, interrupting, um, we, we're, we're not sitting there oh, sort of watch, watching the uh, epidemic sweep through and kill uh, enormous numbers of people. The, 1919 is the one census in which India's population, 1921 is the one census when India's population actually goes down from 1911. So it's, it's an enor enormous shock. We're not doing that. We're trying. So in that sense, again, I don't think this is, I don't think there is anything like this. I also think that we don't, really don't understand what's happened. I mean, there was this whole, I think rather uh, maybe uh, overbearing conversation about how a, a million people could easily die. We haven't had anything like that. Whatever we can disagree about the nature of the measurement, I have, I, I have a particular bugbear here. I'll keep coming back to it that we're doing nothing good about measurement right now. Even with the one one hundred thousand tests, I think we're way behind, and suddenly we're not making that data public in ways that should be. But nonetheless, I think there is no evidence of hospitals being jammed, except maybe in in parts of Bombay. Uh, there, there's, there's no evidence of uh, people kind of, just the death rates seem to be lower rather than higher uh, in the last month, uh, largely because traffic deaths are so much worse uh, problem than anything else. We really should be, it, this should make us rethink traffic because it, it's, uh, it's, now, having said that, is are, are, are our death rates low or high? Uh, it's an interesting question because if you redo our death rates based on global age profiles, our death rates are high. Uh, we are very young. So people who are dying in India don't die in other places. Uh, so we are really, uh, people in their 50s and 60s are the ones who are dying in India. If you look at those death rates, they are 1% in other countries and 3% in India. So it's, it, we, we really, uh, it depends on, but should we use that? Should we think of this as being um, a measure of directly a, controlling for age? Or should we realize that this is actually, um, you know, why, while this, this is mostly a measure of the spread of the disease, not of the not of the of the mortal, mortality consequences. So just understanding what this means, does this mean that the disease is spreading slower than we expected? Uh, my guess is yes, but also uh, when it's reaching younger people, they're actually dying more than they should. So if you put those two facts together, I don't know what exact, certainly the models, we, global models we were using are mostly unreliable. Uh, they're not telling us anything. I, I, I think one of the things we've understood is that the spreading of the disease is extremely clustered. I think that there is probably a two-day window within which some people with a high viral load spread a lot of disease, like this one man in a choir who infected the entire choir uh, because they were all singing together, but it, he was exactly the right spot. So we don't actually know the epidemiological profile, this idea of the R0 being a number is completely unreliable because essentially there are, uh, it depends on who comes in contact with whom where. And if you get, get that to happen at the wrong time, you end up with a huge number of people infected. We have a fact that I think is stunning in India. I think the of the people who, who uh, migrants who came back from different places to Bihar, the infection rates are extremely different. 
uh, I think the ones who came back from Delhi had a 25% migrant infection rate or something. It was just, and then it could be 2% as well. And I think that's just saying that we, you know, we need to be focused on not the uh, average, but the variation in that number and what that says about how to think about the whole epidemic. I think we are only beginning to scratch the surface of that. So I think in, in, epidemiologically as well, I think we are basically very much at the beginning of thinking about this. And I'm, and among those people, I'm neither a macroeconomist nor an epidemiologist. Uh, Norshad said some very flattering things and I'm grateful to him, but I really am uh, not an expert on either side of this, this equation. There are two, two, two pieces here and there are better people on both sides. I, I, with that, let me, uh, I'll come back to the question of what, what we should hope for in the middle of the conversation. There's a bunch of imponderables that need to be maybe discussed before we come there. Sure. So, so you know, I, I absolutely meant what I said, Abhijit, about, about, about you. And the reason I did is because you have this ability to uh, know what's happening with individuals and connect it with this big picture. And that's very unique. And so, you know, so your point just now about uh, the infection rate, you know, of migrants, uh, for example, and, you know, now, do you, do you have any sense of whether that, say, 25% rate is because the migrants got infected while they were traveling together back to Bihar? or they started off infected? I have no, no sense of that. No sense, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that what it's saying is that being in the place with one of these super spreaders, I think there are super spreaders, and super spreaders may not be, a ca I think it's a question of both viral load, some people seem to have much higher viral loads, and the question of time. So there's like a two and a half day window within which you are really infectious and otherwise you're not very infectious. I, I think that, and so I, my guess is that also, I think it's almost surely aerosol spreading. It's not surface that's really important. It's aerosol as people uh, sneezing, coughing into the air and you being very near. I think those seem to be uh, what people are coming, increasingly coming to find as the key moments. So I think that that's, so they could have been in the same truck, back of the same truck somewhere and, and they would have caught it. But it's, it's, it's really it's very important that we take account of the fact that it's going to be extremely clustered as a result. Yes. Meaning there will be uh, places which look identical and our predictive ability is going to be extremely low or where, where it's going to be uh, a lot of people and why some other people don't get it. It's really like, and so those, that, those people, uh, you know, this general idea of, of contact tracing is going to give us fairly weak predictions because if I meet this person on the, you know, on his third day will be very different from on his second day. So it's going to be, a, uh, I think the predictive power of our models is going to be extremely limited. I want to, and I think if we want to do something about it, this, I, I have some, some um, I've learned something about that, how to think about the question of uh, what, what we do uh, to, to be a bit more sophisticated about the data. I, I can come back to that if you want. But Actually, it's, it's, Sorry? If you can say something more about that, about the data, that would be very useful because, you know, one of the, uh, uh, one of the, one of the comments that I've heard is that, you know, you know, the, you know, this, our current government, as you know, has been, one of the things they've been accused of is of, um, uh, is of uh, uh, fudging data when it comes to economic growth numbers and so on. And from talking to different people, including, uh, uh, you know, past uh, chief economic advisors and uh, chief statisticians and so on, they've all said, actually, they're not fudging data. They just don't release data that's uh, uncomfortable. 
So, for example, uh, you know, the April GST data um, was horrifying. So uh, it's never been officially released. You know, we're on the 22nd of May and the GST data has yet not been released for April because it's so bad. Um, but how bad it is, we don't know because it's not been released. Uh, so, you know, if you could if you could suggest to us what we do at the city level, um, especially uh, because that's something we might be able to influence in our own communities. What data should we be gathering? What should we be looking for? What should we be putting together? And even on a broader level, you know, what should we be collecting so that we are deciding things on the basis of data and science and not on the basis of what someone thinks is the right thing to do today? Let me just uh, say something about the, the, uh, the epidemiological side of it, where I think that uh, one thing that we could try to put in place, at least in some, maybe just in some municipalities or some some districts, is a reporting system. We don't really have a reporting system right now of people, um, you know, gathering data uh, data in their neighborhoods of high clusters of either sari, uh, you know, some kind of uh, rep respiratory illnesses, or the thing that seems to be much more predictive is anosmia. Uh, people not getting, losing a sense of taste and smell. The, the, that has an enormously high predictive power relative to anything else. Um, it's the why Sari is actually almost unpredictive, as far as I can tell. Uh, you know, there's some correlation, but it's very weak. You, you get other reasons why people start getting, you know, the, the cuffs and stuff like that. So, whereas anosmia seems to be extremely predictive. Uh, it's one thing that's distinctive of, of uh, COVID-19 is anosmia. So, I think one could, and it's not a difficult thing, it's not a subtle question. If people are complaining of, about having lost their sense of taste and smell, that's a very good marker, and if there's a lot of people in one place, so I, I think that this is this this is something that somebody could gather, or even social media could be announced, uh, organized to say, "Are we hear, hearing this uh, uh, this reaction from people?" It's not it's not rocket science. It's we're not asking them to di diagnose disease. We're just saying, "Are people complaining about not being able to taste anything, or smell anything?" And I, I think that's a that's a fairly straightforward uh, metric and people could report that at the uh, at the neighborhood level, at the ward level in a municipality, at the panchayat level, or even at the hamlet level. People could just say at the ward level, they could say, uh, look, you know, in my ward, I hear, the, hear a lot of people. And the fact that it can be wrong is, you know, if people have small samples and maybe they have five people and they think it's uh, 500. But that's still better than any information we have. If the, if, the, if the disease is very clustered, then the even at hundred thousand tests, we have very low chance of picking up, and we're still not doing hundred thousand tests. Uh, a very small part of the tests are actually being done in in for the general population, and in particular uh, for populations that are. Uh, asymptomatic. I think that's so, but I think if there was a way to do it so that we, we would do these a lot more of these tests in places where people complain about, uh, you know, anosmia or uh, we would be able to actually be uh, able to respond to it much quicker. So I, I do feel that there is a sense in which local, local, the engagement with the local level has in general been weak in this, uh, and that's true of, I would say the same is true of, of all the, um, all the ways of dealing with migrants. And we, we really should be uh, letting district authorities, giving them money to deal with this problem, uh, block, even block level money. We, we're really keeping the money at the center, which is to me is a mistake. You know, the states can borrow a little bit more, but now, but even that it seems to me to be 
the order of magnitude seems to be wrong, that we should be giving a lot more money, especially at the district and block level. Give the district magistrate a, 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 a and a fund which he can draw upon if he finds a cluster of people who happen to be stuck in the middle of his district. Uh, I think that you sort of, if we think of this as being a problem that's happening at a much more granular level, we have a much better chance of tackling it. It's, uh, it's you know, the, I think this enormous diversity of experiences we find the, I, I, I even with the, with, all my doubts about the data, I feel that there are places where the mortality rates seem much higher than others. Uh, it's true that the, that the, I don't know anything about the infected to, uh, to fatality ratio because the infected may not be measured, but the population to fatality ratio is very different in, you know, it's in, in Kerala versus in Maharashtra or in, Gujarat, these states, or you know, in West Bengal, they have very high. Uh, each of them seem to have a very high uh, sort of uh, infection rate. Uh, population based again, in West Bengal, it seems very low. In Maharashtra, much higher. So you know, I, I think one should just think about the population based uh, rate, and you can see that there is enormous variation, and that variation is probably replicated many folds over in neighborhoods, the neighborhoods where lots of people are sick and dying, a lot of neighborhoods where that's not happening. And if we don't think about the neighborhood as being the key uh, place to, uh, to address it, I think we're, not, we're going to get it wrong. So just in terms of epidemiological data, I think we need to, f and in terms of, you know, migra migrant data, where are vulnerable populations? I think we need to throw the, that problem to the district that the district has to think of ways, suggest ideas, give them money, uh, and try to get a much more local reporting structure. I think we're we're sort of think, trying to run it from the state capital or from the national capital, and that's just not the right idea in my view. Could 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 we pursue this comment that you made on migration for a bit, please? Because you know your 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 wonderful book with Esther. The, the the first major chapter in the book is on migration. Uh, I have, uh, by the way, I have a I have a complaint about the book. The complaint about the book is that some of the chapters are so good that I reread them instead of moving on and reading more chapters. So I've, I've read, yeah, I've read three of the chapters twice, and there's still three or four chapters that I have to go. So you know. So anyway, so the migration yeah, chapter, yeah, yeah. the migration chapter, uh, is. It's a great chapter, and it's uh, it you know it 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 provides a lot of insight on what motivates uh, migrants to move, uh, to to undertake that uh, that journey, that uprooting of themselves from uh, from their hometowns. Um, and if you look at if you look at you know you're very familiar with what we've all seen on our TV screens over these last uh, seven weeks in the country, as Migrants have struggled to get home uh, as, uh, uh, as they've uh, struggled with uh, livelihoods, with meeting basic needs. So, you know, if you can say something more about, you know, how that should be addressed. And I think your point about leaving it to the district administration, you know, and, you know, how, how would you go about, if you were, if you were, if you were the PMO today, what would you do for migrants? I think that I think that I mean the, I, I think the basic idea I think for a first first step is relatively obvious, which is allow everybody. I, I would say cancel all or put in abeyance all ration cards from before and issue ration fresh ration cards uh, to everyone now, just uh, so that you know. No duplication. You get fresh ration cards and and try to use you know to whatever extent possible other to deduplicate. But fine if you can't deduplicate, don't do duplicate. Don't don't deny people cards because you can't verify them. Just give it give it away so that everybody has the right to go to the to and go to the wherever they are 
I think food is really, I mean, they're really starving. It's not, we're not talking about starving as a metaphor. We're talking about literally they, these people, most of, many of them have no savings. And they, that's not uh, a comment on their irresponsibility. They send their money home. Uh, you know, the typical thing is, as you know, uh, Noshad, well, uh, a lot of them get food from their employer. They will actually, construction workers live on the site. The, the employer might give them actually some food to cook on the construction site. They often live in, you know, they build a tarp, tarp on, put a tarp on it and live under it or something. And or just if one floor has been built, they live under that floor. That's, that's absolutely standard. For those people, they were they had no expectation that they would need anything. They were they, they don't have savings for the right reason, which is that you if you have a chance, you should send your money home where they need money. You are you are sort of you have a life of you know right now you 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 just so you have money for your return ticket, maybe a little bit more, but they're sending an enormous amount of money back. And that's how our rural economy, in a sense, functions, is by these, you know, urban uh, temporary migrants sending money back. And that, so if we know that as a fact, which I think we do, then I think we, we know that basically these people are really starving. They have no social networks in these places often. They are, I mean, or the net networks are with people like them who are also temporary migrants. They're not really, they don't have a, like a, a friend who, who can let, give them a place to stay for the next uh, few months. I mean, their friends are also not wealthy. There's not spa no space. I, I just think that space and, you know, the space and uh, uh, food are both extraordinarily immediate compulsion. So they're, they're acting, as you can see, they're acting des desperate and they're desperate. They are desperate. I think the key key point to recognize is that this is not, this is not that they are kind of uh, whatever, uh, irresponsible people. They are acting desperate because they are desperate. And if, if so, then just providing them with food and shelter would uh, in a sense be, now it's not easy to provide shelter because you have to think of ways in which you don't want to bring together large numbers of people. That's the, because this, the, the spreading is, you know, if you have a 200 people, you're more, much more likely to spread than if you have 10 people in a, so you want to create somehow think that through. Um, I don't know why, for example, uh, the construction sites they were, where they were working are not required to house them. Um, just house them. Don't have to give them anything. Just let them stay. I, I think closing area, you know, where they could, you know, so it might, 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 that will mean small groups will stay in different places. I think we need to be more creative. And in that sense, I think the local authorities are much better positioned to negotiate those to see, okay, here there is a, an empty school building. We can put some people in that or I, I think that we need to be much, much more flexible about this. But then, then the second question is food. And food, I think we could solve. I think if we, if we just decided to give everybody the right to get free food, what's the worst thing that will happen? We will lose some free food to people who don't need it. Uh, we, we have, I think given the extent of displacement, I don't think that's a big deal. So let, let's assume that that's, that's uh, also something we can just do. So I think that I would I would have started by by just giving them a sense because I think this will have extremely this experience if it's really horrible getting the migrants back will be hard they'll just I think the well, the point we make in the book is that enormous number of people take extreme poverty over migrating to the city that's the fact that is striking not the opposite that people go go, go to the city but that they will you have bunch of people in UP earning, uh, you know, half of what they could earn in the city and they don't go because it's still too unpleasant. Life is just too unpleasant in the city. And if you now add to it that, you know, there is this and it could be that the disease comes back. I would say very likely the disease comes back. Um, 
another shutdown. I mean, really, I, mean, I think that if we don't prepare for that moment now to say that if we are, we are reopening, let's reopen. I think there is, we don't really know enough to justify the extremely um, rigid lockdown. But then once we reopen, what, what's the next step? Well, if the disease comes back, the ideal scenario, going back to your question, the most optimistic scenario for the next few months, the va vaccine, I think, I'm guessing still, by the time a vaccine comes, will be in the spring of next year, at the earliest. The most optimistic scenario is uh, that. And I'll, maybe I'll say something about that if you ask me again. But I, uh, but I think that that's, given that, Moderna is saying, for example, the January, um, the US government was just talking about an October vaccine, but I think the US government is now trying to have everything before the election. So I don't believe anything they say. Um, so uh, they have truly, uh, you know, in terms of losing credibility, I think they have done an amazing job, uh, Mr. Trump has. Uh, but it, so, it's going to be uh, the it's going to be the next um, um, year and of still dealing with the disease and the disease will come back. The best case scenario, just to answer your question, is that the disease comes back locally, that we can we can identify where it's coming back quickly, lock down that area. So that's why I think the local information piece of it. Is, uh, is extremely important that we should think of green zones as being places where the reporting should be the most stringent. That that's where we should be. Red zones, we kind of know that there is disease is there. We should be tracking it. Uh, in green zones, we should be really worried that uh, there's a part of the green zone. And this idea that the, the zones are too large, it's again, it's going to be extremely clustered and we will have to shut down if we think of these zones as being, you know, as large as they are, we're going to shut down a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be shut down. I think if we targeted the information collection much more, and I think developing a model of that, even in like in Pune or something, where you know you just get people to report uh, and try to provide that information to the city, try to develop a model of how to use local information better. I think that's going to be one of the things that might be a game changer. Thank you very much, Abhijit. Thank you. I, you know, I have. I want to get into one of the questions that I want to ask you about is actually uh, on slums. Uh, but uh, I'll come to that uh, in in a minute. I'm going to t ask uh, Suni. First of all, actually, I'm going to ask Mr. Ghosh. Uh, I understand you're now with us. So, would you would you like to ask? Uh, uh, a question, please, and then I'll go to Sunil, and then I'll come back to you, Abhijit, with the with the with the questions on slums. No, uh, uh, thank you, Abhijit, uh, to accept our invitation. Thank you. For... Just some of some of the couple of minutes, uh, but I have been listening very good and learning, and uh, 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 I have not in a question now. But if you continue on that, at the last moment I have the two question I like to ask on that. Uh, so if you say that that now I can be asked the one question is a big way on that. Uh, what is the new role can play in a banking industry in our country in the situation of this to make a new India? Hmm. <laughs> you ask easy questions. I, I, I haven't been thinking about um, the banking industry and new India. Um, at all, uh, let me say. I, I've been thinking about migrants a bit, but not not at all about the banking industry. Uh, what do I have to say? So I think that clearly um, the banking industry, as you as you well know, uh, the banking industry persistently uh, has persistently failed to be uh, a kind of a uh, agent of of change, they tend we, we see this this re. I mean, uh, uh, many of the banks have this 
you know, go through this cycle of lending to so-called blue chip uh, borrowers till the day when they become uh, red chip or whatever. They, you know, this 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 is a pattern we've seen over and over again. This sort of this idea that the kind of clients that Bondon Bank has tried to recruit uh, are always seen as being dangerous. And then there are these blue chip clients who are all going to be uh, reliable. And then after, uh, you know, and then you get a newspaper report uh, that suddenly they have stopped payment. And then two days later, it turns out that they were, uh, they were uh, in default or, or effectively close to being in default for months. And, Somehow the banking sector has not acted. I think the bank, banking sector could educate itself a bit more on on where the risks are. It just seems to be we play this playbook. We've seen too many times the playbook of of you know uh, whatever uh, you know. I don't want to name any particular company, uh, but there's too many of them who've done the same thing. Of of till the, yesterday they were blue chip. Today they are bankrupt. That transition uh, needs to be. The banking sector needs to be much more alert to that transition. And I don't understand how this is happening, but it's happening. My 20 years of, of being interested in the banking sector, I've seen this happen in 97, it happened in 90, and it's happening in 2019. It's exactly the same pattern. Blue chip yesterday, uh, gone tomorrow. That, that can't possibly be uh, a result of Good banking. Now, conversely, we know that if you are uh, if you don't have kind of blue blue chip looking assets or you don't have real estate, banks don't lend to you. On the other side, uh, that, I mean th those two things. The banking sector seems to be um, managing to both not lend to the right people and uh, not manage to monitor the loans is given. Uh, effectively, so uh, I mean, I I say this with great admiration for you and for what you're trying to do. But I think the the average performance of the banking sector is remarkably remarkably poor. I would I would say even by global standards, we are kind of an outlier in terms of how much uh, NPS we generate year after year after year, uh, and the one reaction we usually have is when we complain about NPS, banks stop lending. That's not the solution. So uh, I'm going to, with that, I, I don't have anything deep to say other than what I and many people have said over the last 20 years, but this, this hasn't changed very much. You get this cycle of, of credit denial and uh, then a little opening, then a bunch of bankruptcies, then credit denial. And that's a cycle we've been seeing since the uh, last 20 years we've seen this. Thank you. Is that unfair, what I said? <laughs> you're, you're muted, Mr. Ghosh. Mr. Ghosh, you're muted. So, uh, thank you, Dada. Uh, I have been asking on that another thing is very related. Uh, you are also uh, uh, sometimes have been expressed on that to give the cash money to the poor people hands in this time. So what types of potential risk you feel uh, that will be created or how we can be mitigate that types of risk in the country? So it's, it's interesting. I think we have, um, we have, I think the, the Jandan accounts were set up with the idea that this is going to be uh, this is going to be the channel through which everybody can be reached. Um, for what we haven't quite understood, but it looks like while uh, you know the government has sent some money to these accounts, a lot of these accounts don't seem to be um, they seem to be inactive, or people seem to be. Mm, not have access to it. There's some survey data now um, that we see, and we see that people are not necessarily connected to those accounts. So it's it's a. I think we 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 haven't quite understood what is it that stopped this 
the Jandan accounts from being used uh, very much. They, but it was, it was already known that they were not being used a lot. A lot of those accounts. So is it distance? Is it that basically they are, you know, five kilometers away from the uh, bank? Uh, did we not set up, a, you know, in, in some ways, African countries have gone all the way to using entirely phone banking. Uh, you, you know, you see that in countries like Togo, which are you know, infinitely poorer than us, uh, are, can, they can reach basically half the population with cash transfers within a week. Uh, we, we, we're not able to do it partly because we, we haven't integrated the whole infrastructure uh, very well. So I, I think that uh, the big dangers are just, I think we're going to miss a lot of people. So I, I think that that goes back to the point I was making before, which is that I, I, I think the idea that we should not do it because we're going to miss a lot of people is silly. In my view, we should think of that as being, uh, you know, that's a reason to, to engage with a, lo a lot of local, uh, you know, give the money to the states, to give the money to the districts, to give the money to NGOs, uh, or whoever it is that can connect at the uh, you to 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 identify the populations that are uh, are not connected. So I think we know that there are a bunch of people uh, in Tamil Nadu. We we've been um, actually trying to work with the government. The government is very keen right now to provide cash to the elderly. Uh, Tamil Nadu has uh, because of its early demographic transition has lots of elderly. Who are live alone, and those people are, are they seem we did a survey of them. They don't seem to know. They know there's a lockdown. They don't know why, and they don't know exactly what they're supposed to do. And the government is um, has tried to push pensions to them. There is a pension scheme. A lot of these people are excluded from it because the government thinks that they have some source of money or the other, which they might. But right now, a lot of those things have also broken down. You, the son in the city was sending them money, is not sending them money anymore. They're baffled by this whole thing. And yet, we can't unlock. The government is finding it hard to unlock the money flows because we have, we have set up a system of checks and balances, et cetera. So I think we, we need to have a, a, an, a moment of absolution. You know, uh, we are, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Pope says, your sins are gone. We, we really need to let uh, the government to the local officials to make mistakes. We need to let people say that, look, you know, I gave her money. She may not have needed it, but yeah. I can't judge this. I don't want someone to starve to death. I, I really think that that's a, uh, the amount of savings we were looking at are like 200 rupees, so they, which is nothing. So I, I feel that there is a need to uh, to to be willing to make mistakes, to be uh, generous rather than uh, stingy, and to also to use multiple channels, to not just say that, you know, we'll put money in Jandan accounts, because some people seem to be not accessing those accounts. They may not know that they have the accounts, or they may have not realized that the accounts are actually reusable, or maybe the accounts are, I don't know, uh, too far away or whatever. They're not using the money. Um, maybe, maybe they don't need it. I, I, I'm somehow somewhat skeptical about that. But in any case, the main point is that there are lots of people who don't have these accounts. And for those people, we need a mechanism for identifying them. And that cannot be, uh, it cannot be that, you know, if you cannot identify it, then you don't need it. That's, that's going to get us to a, a lot of human tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. I, I'm going to go to Sunil uh, Munjal next uh, for a question, and then I'll uh, come back to you, please, on the question of flux. Right. Um, Abhijit, this is Sunil Munjal. Here. Hi. Hi. My question is about what you wrote in the Good Economics for Hard Times. You spoke about uh, universal ultra basic income. Is it in any manner different from the universal basic income that's being discussed worldwide? And the second part to this is, at this moment, the government is clearly 
shown its inability to use more liquidity. So because a lot of the, the, the support that they've announced is actually in monetary measures and not so much in fiscal. Would you be okay with them printing more money to provide the universal basic income or cash directly in consumers' hands at this time, especially the poor? Yeah, we started. I've been saying uh, that I would be perfectly okay with them printing money to to give cash to to the poor. I don't think anything. I think if you look at what the U.S. is doing, what Japan is doing, what Europe is doing, Europe, uh, the Germans have now gone to extraordinary uh, aggressive uh, monetization of debt. I mean, this is this is if the Germans can do it, I, I, there is no country that that has. You know, very articulated uh, kind of fiscal and monetary policy that hasn't gone there except us in a sense. We really are among the the most conservative macro managers. I don't see a reason to do it. I think we know exactly why to. You know, the biggest risk is there'll be some inflation, but you know, this is this is uh, much more, uh, much less of a danger than uh, a deflation. I think we we really could get into a deflationary spiral. We uh, so related to that, uh, it's uh, it's quite quite. Um, I think the reason why we call it universal ultra basic income is that I think we wanted to make the point that even a small amount creating channels for transferring a small amount of money is actually quite important even the amount of money doesn't have to be huge to to have to be consequential and i think one of the things that uh we this crisis shows is if if we had a mechanism which was every individual whether or not he's at home could get some money to live on we would have this migrant thing would not have happened we, we, it's exa it's a very good illustration of what having open channels does so part of the idea we were pushing was that we should be in a place where when there's a, a let's say a, a drought or anything we were not talking about thinking of pandemic since we wrote the book before the pandemic but we could the government should be in a place to send resources quickly and not think about you know is this person eligible or not let's not think about those questions so make it ultra basic it's you know it's what a desperate person with extreme uh, in, dis, in extreme distress could use to survive the next few weeks. Think of it as yeah, okay, you said the next few weeks, right? Okay. Yeah, that's 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 very much the idea that we were pushing. Is that look, you know, let's let's not try to design a system that deals with. I think for a country like India, dealing with long-term indigents, uh, I think that would require other mechanisms and we don't have the resources to do it. We have the resources to not have someone starve to death or act in self-destructive ways because they fear that they're going to starve to death, like the migrants are, you know, walking back to, in this heat to, uh, to UP and people are dying on the road or something. It, it, it seems to me that it's, it's we're not trying, this is not aiming very high, but it's probably aiming at the right place. Thanks. So, uh, I'm going to I call you set up for a longer chat on a different subject, Abhijit. Okay, please do. So, so Abhijit, I, I wanted to, you know, take this opportunity to actually um, ask you about uh, something that has been sort of just going through my, 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 my head of late, which is the whole question of uh, of slums, urban slums that we have in uh, in the country, and our real neglect of them over decades. You know, uh, uh, at I asked my father uh, yesterday. I said, you know, when you were in Bombay in the fifties, uh, were there slums? And he said, oh yes. Um, so it's something you know we've obviously lived with for you know decades, and uh, we kind of close our eyes to them, uh, we drive past them, we employ people as, in, as domestic help uh, who live in the slums without really concerning ourselves much about where they live and in what circumstances. And it's now suddenly become a 
big issue, especially in Bombay, but not only in Bombay, in many parts of the, in many cities around the country. And I just wondered, you know, if you could uh, help us think through how we should be thinking about slums in the sort of short, medium, and long term. You know, in the short term, uh, we seem to be approaching slums as a uh, as a place where infection is spreading, and therefore we need to contain it. And I really worry that we're trying to contain it within the slum without trying to do things that are good for the slum. We're just trying to keep it from spreading out of the slum, which really makes, which to me is the makings of a humanitarian disaster, actually. Um, but, you know, what should one do in the short term uh, with slums? Uh, in the medium term, as things normalize, as the immediate health crisis wanes, how should we be thinking about, uh, about slums? And in the long term, how do we really fundamentally address this as a quality of life issue? I mean, you know, it's because if we can come out of this whole period uh, with some fundamental approaches to you know, redevelop the land, uh, create good quality housing somewhere, uh, provide good public transport, from that somewhere to where people actually have jobs and are employed, um, you know, and move the country on from where we are with uh, the, uh, the situation that we have. It could be really, it could be a real restart um, to, uh, to, 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 to our country and we would not be in a sense wasting this crisis. Um, so you know, I wondered, you know, I'm sorry to spend to have taken so much time to ask the question, but I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, how you think, are you thinking about this? Can you, can you help us think through this, uh, you know, in short, medium, long term, how should we be thinking about slums? I think it's a big issue and a potentially huge improvement that we could make in the country. So I, I, I feel like, I've been very influenced by my friend Ed Glazer on this. And I think one yeah. of the points he makes is that we are a country which has our overall view of Harvard policy has been, I think he wouldn't say this, but I'll say it, insane. Uh, we, we, we have, we have, we have, we, our FSA regulations are insane. We given our population density and our inability to provide quality infrastructure at scale. So cities like Bombay should therefore be infinitely dense. Uh, there are two, in fact, even Bombay is not as dense as it should be. That's his very much his view that we have, we, and Delhi, of course, is kind of maniacal. Uh, uh, you know, you have this enormous spread of, of the, of, you know, no higher than four story buildings in a city where, you know, every, everybody else has to live in in Dwarka, Rohini, and be in a bus for an hour to get. So I think that if we don't rationalize our land use policy, uh, the the premium on uh, you know living close is always going to be extremely high. Uh, it's going because in in some ways. Um, so if you try to clear the slums, the worry is that. Uh, the and you try to build nice housing there, for example. The worry is that then what happens is people, it becomes just a windfall for people and the windfall then uh, means you don't actually get a change. You get a bunch of people living on, on, on there um, who then uh, on that same land, but who may be somewhat richer. So people, you get a reass reassignment, some poor people move, very far away. So that per se doesn't, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It might well be that maybe it's in their interest to monetize the asset they have, but it, it, it means that we don't actually change the overall patterns of living. Whereas what we try, what we really try, want to try to do is think of how to increase density uniformly, not just create a bunch of pockets of extremely dense, you know, basically mega chawls, uh, which chawls were chance. in a sense Bombay's idea, 19th century Bombay's idea of how to uh, create housing for workers. This was exactly what they were trying to solve. And they 
they came up with this idea of having, you know, very limited public spaces, uh, just one room that opens onto a, a, a veranda. It's very interesting. And it was thought out. It was not, it was a, but I think that's the last time we thought about this question. Uh, and uh, I think we need to think of it as being, uh, how do we increase the density of middle class living? So I, I would have thought that, you know, if we, we should start by reducing uh, the pressure on the land. And the way to do that would be to allow a lot more people to, to buy housing in a reasonable place by lifting the FSA regulations. If, if people could move in, if the center of Delhi uh, could be much more dense, uh, you, we would actually have a lot more uh, housing available in the city. The reason why we don't have housing is because we, we have kind of, and therefore the trade-off is between living close or uh, and in a slum and living, you know, two hours away. And we, we you know, in Bombay, you, you, if you have the alternative is to live in, in past Thane, and then you are in, uh, you take two hours to get to work, that's two working hours uh, where you could be making a living. So you'd live in a, in a slum instead. And th those trade-offs should not be the only, only options we have. If we could just uniformly increase density, I think we would have, we would then be able to say, look, you know, there is some place between, I mean, even now, Shivaji Park has, you know, these nice four, four, three, four story houses. Uh, you know, the other, uh, uh, where my mother grew up uh, is the same. It's not, uh, we are we're really, you know, most of it is still very low rise relative to a city like Bombay, which is extremely little land and an enormous population. We are, we are nowhere there. We could let, you know, Dadar be twice or three times more dense. We'll have to think about the, the, this goes with transport policies. We need to be much more stringent about letting people park cars and drive cars. And, you know, I, Vikram will resent my, uh, Vikram Kiloskal will resent my uh, attempt to shut down the uh, expansion of the automotive industry. But I, th I think that all of those things go together. We need to think through this whole, whole uh, question of how to, how to accommodate uh, the traffic that we, if we increase density, the traffic becomes that much worse. And so we need to be able to, you know, I think uh, the idea of alternative days was much reviled, but it was a decent idea. And uh, we could go the Singapore way and really tax the hell out of people who drive in, in center city uh, unnecessarily, get people to walk more. I think one thing we learned from this crisis is that we drive too much because we kill so many people. I mean, every time people drive, they kill people. Uh, we were seeing a reduction in mortality rates as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that just says how, how bad our roads are. And so I, I, I think that it's a, we have to think of it through, not just as a matter of re taking the slum the land away from the slum dwellers, which you could do in different ways, but I think as a matter of generally not giving them these dire choices, you you know, the, where they they in a sense either hold on to the asset because they can't really think of a, being in a train for two hours, or they or they don't, or they leave and they move two hours away, and therefore their incomes go down because they can't. They're four hours a day of of not working. So I, I think those dire choices have to be, make it very hard to do. Then everybody protests as the moment you try to do it. If this was a more reasonably developed city so that there was more space for everybody, then you know, your choice might be 45 minutes away and people might be willing to do that. But I just think that we need to have a more graded approach. It's not just slums and everything else is fine and slums are the problem is, is exactly the, you know, the, our instinct to think about this. Uh, and we've always dealt with it this way, which is, I think, the, I'm, I'm kind of now channeling a glazer, but I think that's, he's right on that. Okay, thank you. Well, thank so, you very much for that. I'm gonna go to uh, Vinayak uh, Chatterjee next. Uh, Vinayak? 
You'll have to unmute. From Gurgaon, this is another Vinayak addressing to the Vinayak. So, uh, good evening to you. And uh, just to refresh collective memory, I had the pleasure of uh, we had the pleasure of meeting each other during the Shere <coughs> Bangali ceremonies many years ago together when we were there together. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, greetings from Gurgaon. I am too happy reading your book, and uh, it is in the spirit of your great work amongst the poor all over the world, poor economics, that I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question. We are now all talking about migrant, migrant, but the migrant business is just a subset of the larger superset of what we call the unorganized sector, the informal sector, or the vulnerable self-employed in urban and suburban areas in India. Migrant is just a subset of people we see traveling back. But this section and the uncomfortability of the question is that as a society, and I'm including politicians, bureaucrats, industry, and very specifically economists also, both macro and microeconomists, of having seriously neglected this sector, who are such an important constituent of the economic delivery system of any nation. We have in the last many decades, are guilty as a society of having neglected this sector and it has suddenly come in full blast in our faces and come home to roost. What would you say about this is, 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 the, is the question that I want to ask you. So I, I mean, I think your the unorganized sector is, I mean, I, I think if you take the conventional economics of the of the uh, of the right, I would say they have often made the point that this is related to our uh, way we uh, have uh, managed the labor market. So I, I do think that there is some. It's not entirely new this conversation. I think we've had this conversation about the fact that eighty-five percent or some very large proportion of the labor force is not in the organized labor force. This conversation has been going on for a while. I, I, I think that you're a little bit, uh, I think, unfair to the economics community. Let me defend them a little bit. I think that I think that this conversation is going on for a while. I think the question that I think uh, we now need to confront is, well, I, I think the migrants are a good example precisely because they are at the kind of the hurting edge of that, which is if we going to, I, I, I think that it's very unlikely, even with the um, rather um, extreme uh, moves in changing labor market conditions in kind of states like UP, I'm guessing that this sector will, will remain large, that it will not go to zero. Assuming that suddenly, I'm going to assume, and I, I maybe have some reasons to think about it, but in any case, assuming that we don't get rid of this sector, we need to think about the fact that as a result of being uh, self-employed, we have no mechanism for, uh, you know, all these channels that we use, which are basically monetary. If we, if we could emphasize monetary policy channels, these people are the hardest to reach. They really have no uh, access to, I mean, there's some statement about how we're going to uh, provide credit to this sector, but providing credit to people who have no uh, known address is very difficult. And no, the banking sector has, it's easy to announce that we'll give loans to everybody. It's hard to implement. And we've learned this many times. The banking sector finds ways to not give loans that it doesn't know how to do. And so I, I think that we need to take into account the fact that we have a population of people who, who are vulnerable and for whom, if we wanted to do something for them, we have no way of doing it. We don't have a way of, other than giving them food, we don't have a mechanism for dealing with them. We don't, they don't really exist in any, any proper database as, you know, the potential beneficiaries. So we have to use other means. So in the rural areas, you could use 
the uh, NRDGA roles, for example, people who have applied for NRDGA as a way to give people money. You could, uh, any family that applies, you could give them money. We don't have NRDGA in urban areas. So in urban areas, we really don't have a scheme. And this was known for a while, that we don't have a scheme for the poor in urban areas. We, we have something in rural, rural areas, in urban areas, at best we have PDS, and PDS has the problem that PDS is linked to where you are domiciled, not where you're living. And that means that if I happen to be in Bombay and um, you know the pandemic strikes, I'm starving because there's no, I have no. So we need to think of, of ways in which this population, we can access them to provide help. And we don't have a mechanism for it. So I, I think you're right in saying we have we, we we do talk about the unorganized sector, but not as a way of of what happens to that unorganized sector if there is a massive shock like this. We don't we we that's a conversation we, we never have. That's that's the conversation we try to bring into our book when we say that we should have this thing that uh, we call a UUBI, the uh, ultra universal ultra basic income. The reason we talk about it is precisely this, which is we want to have a mechanism by which we can connect to people who are who are not um, not uh, the rural uh, workforce who are potentially uh, some by uh, NRDG, but by some, for a, a, a group that is not covered by any obvious welfare scheme except PDS. I think that, that, that's a, we haven't actually created a welfare scheme for these people. That's why we can't now, there's nothing we can do about them other than you know, credit. And I doubt that credit is going to be the solution for these people. Thank you. Thanks, Abhijit. Uh, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to go to Dilip Shah from Bhavanipur uh, Education College. Um, the, you know, one of the one of the things that we wrestle with in India, and you know, this is uh, people have commented on relatively low state capacity uh, at, uh, at at various levels of of government to actually deliver uh, at the at the end, um, and you know, you have you have a very nice approach of sort of not being. You know, I don't think anyone would accuse you of being um, uh, a diehard free marketeer. Uh, at the same time, you have, I think, a great uh, belief in using markets to uh, and incentives to uh, uh, deliver benefits that matter to people. So I'm just wondering how you how you think about how do you put these two things pieces together? You know, how do you put the sort of states versus markets? Uh, question on one side and low state capacity on the other side uh, that we have in the country to do the kinds of things that you've been recommending, you know, to uh, how do we, how do we most effectively um, feed people, provide income transfers to people, um, provide basic health care to people, educate people, um, you know, uh, how do we get that right? with this constraint of state capacity? Excellent question. Let me, um, you know, the, I, I guess I'm, um, uh, I could go on about this, so let, let me not. Let me just <laughs> deal with one small piece of it, which is the, uh, the healthcare part of it, because I think that's, that's a very good example. I think some of the other things I think with enough will, we could create um, a universe ultra basic income or something. I think that would be a, it's not, I mean, the, the jam infrastructure could be made better. And I, I think if we were to put the will, will uh, we could have a one nation, one ration card actually implemented and all that. I, I think those are actually relatively, I, I can sort of see my way to that. With healthcare in, in particular, it seems to me that what this has illustrated is also the extreme importance of public health, of people who are professionals, who understand 
uh, some epidemiology, some some uh, some uh, infectious diseases, some you know are able to give reliable advice at the ground level. I, I think that we were sort of. I think one of the things that this illustrates is uh, how how much we we miss having a core of very good people working uh, at the district level dealing with their pandemic at the district level uh, and so and there I I just don't think that that's a problem the market can solve I, I think that's a problem of it's all about regulations connecting you know using the right regulations right using the right uh, making the right connections to to uh, between different problems, etc. So I, I feel that that's a good example of a problem where uh, the state has to be effective. Uh, and I think one thing that I would say I want to take away from this uh, this pandemic is that I think we we there is I think talking we can talk about you know incentives and all those things but in these in these moments people are actually pretty committed there's a lot of people who are pretty committed who are doing a lot of stuff that goes beyond their their the call of their duty and i think that but i think they are not necessarily professionals they're not necessarily trained for it so one message i would say is that we should have a a, a a new uh, national or state level core of uh, of much a much expanded public health core i think public health is um, you know just vaccination rates in some parts of haryana are still extremely low we work we worked in haryana and the haryana government is very was very we, we worked closely with them and they were very very much you know, willing to make it happen, but it's just not easy. And I think getting professionals who who are willing, not simply at the level of uh, you know health secretary or uh, additional secretary health or something, but much much more professionals who are dedicated to the task of improving public health. Some states have them. Tamil Nadu has uh, has been the model people often mention, but I think many states don't and. I think what Kerala showed, if they showed one thing, is that if you actually have a very good local health infrastructure, you can do much better. And I think that's, maybe I want to emphasize that, which is right now, rather than getting, I think that this is something that the state will need to do because it's a lot of it is about coordination and it's not, you know, no market will deliver this. But I think that, and I don't think it is a matter of so much of incentives either. There are lots of people who given, the, but. For example, hazmat uh, and other PPE uh, is not available. We just need to provide it, every one of them with the security. In West Bengal, I know that uh, many health workers are very scared and they don't want to go to work anymore because they think they will catch the disease. But that's absolutely the most perverse reaction you could get. We need them most now. So I, I think that thinking about uh, a core of people whose job is to manage public health crises, uh, who are uh, who are professionals, who are trained, who are given equipment. I think that's going to be. I would say that among things that I have become pretty obvious after this, that's one of them. To me, it's very very important that we expand our public health uh, core uh, substantially. Thank so, you. Thank Abhijit, you, Abhijit. Abhijit, I'm, the, going go to, I'm going to go to Dilip Shah next. The final, uh, let me the one on that, the uh, very big issue for the country of the unemployment. And uh, government have a big program also for M. Nerega. Uh, how, how you are analyzing on that M. Nerega can help to, to the increase the employment. This is the one side. If you see in the last 15 years, uh, I involved with you with the Bandhan Society, have the one program you are study the long time and with a study full also, uh, which is called the targeting to the hardcore poor, reaching to the people, not cash and with the kind and support. So in this moment, Narega 
employment increase and the TSP model, which are working also with the JPAL. Uh, uh, in this situation, what do you like to give your, your suggestion for that? So I, I would say that this is a situation where innovation is probably in the short run a bad idea. So I'm I, I think that I'm not the government has actually the Narega has expanding it has been difficult because it, in some ways it has not we have never implemented the piece of the Narega, which is that if the if the village doesn't provide a job, then everybody gets paid for so that was in the law, which says that you know if you cannot implement this, I think implementation is a big big challenge. And I think that, but I would not this moment. I, I'm a huge admirer of the targeting the hardcore poor program, but I would not say that this is a time when the government which takes a long time to, to come up with anything new. So I think two things I've been saying uh, from the beginning of this, but also before that giving local NGOs the capacity to do whatever it takes. So it might be, uh, you know, create funds so that they can apply for it and do it. Let's not try to legislate because I think if the government tries to say do this or do that, it's going to be a disaster. The Narega, in that sense, I think is a good idea because at least it's a scheme that is understood. The government understands it. And the government takes a very long time to understand anything new. You tell them do this differently, and it's going to be 16 different uh, people will put objections on the file and say that if you do this, this bad thing will happen, et cetera, et cetera. So it was not going to happen. So we, we need free money, which the district can allocate, for example, to, to some program that the, you know, the you know, Bandhan society will run or any other NGO will run at the, at the district level. I think we need not scrutiny from Delhi, but like, you know, the, at the district level, somebody deciding that this is, we, this is a, there's a targeted population that happens to be very vulnerable and not being served, let's serve them. I think that's that mindset of being flexible is extremely important. I would say Narega has one advantage, which is at least it's an established scheme. So the government works better when the scheme is already are well understood. Otherwise, they just get paralyzed. So I, I wouldn't try to get them to do anything new. Maybe the district authorities can allocate money to NGOs that they think are useful things. So I would have gone very much with the district. I, I don't understand why there's not more money assigned to district magistrates and uh, for for doing emergency actions. Thank, Thank you. Ali. you. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Dilip Shah to uh, ask uh, ask one question, and then I'll come to a closing question, please. Dr. Shah? You may need to unmute yourself, Dr. Shah. If not, then okay. If if not, then I'll 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 go ahead. I'll go ahead, please, because um uh, I'll go ahead, please, because the question. Just a second. I is Dilip Shah on, please? Okay, I'll I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead with the last question, then, please, Abhijit, because I know you know we've been we've been um, to you for two, for for a long period of time. Um, and Very good. Thank you. The 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 question is really you know a, a close friend of mine asked me this question today, and uh, you know he asked the question. He said, "Well, he said if uh, if a child's graduating from college uh, this year, in the current environment, uh, what should they?" What should they do? And I, and I, and I sort of, I sort of very facetiously replied. I said, "Well, you know, it's a big bad world out there. Ask them to stay in college." Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, but but can you can you can you provide a more positive and uh, uh, and directional answer than uh, than what I did? Well, you know, in some ways, I feel that uh, for me, uh, I, I I do feel that. Uh, if if this is a moment where it teaches us that um, you know the particular uh, sort of 
way we were thinking about the world is a flawed, that in some ways that we need to take nature more seriously, that nature is a huge danger, that in some sense the public goods are critical. If we learn that the public space, space is important, that, you know, the, that we, and I don't mean by that, uh, just the government, I mean NGOs, I mean, uh, pri you know, private companies, everybody, but in the public space, the, if the public space is important, that in a sense creates an enormous possibility for new leadership. I think we need new leadership, we, new, we, see, we start to see it actually, Greta and all these other people. I feel like we, I think whether they're right or wrong, I think new leadership is actually needed. We need to think of a world which is much more public spirited than it is. I think if this pandemic shows one thing, it shows that, you know, cynicism and cruelty go very quickly closely with the one or other. You can be privately uh, cynical and therefore effectively cruel. And that's what we have done a bit in our country. That, and I think that we need to just kind of re reaffirm uh, the public spirit. And the public spirit is, I think since the 80s, since Reagan and all these things, we have sort of had this assault on the public spirit that we you know there is no point being public spirited there were moments of hope like around 2000 with with the with Gavi and all these things but in general there's been an assault on the public spirit i feel if i were young i would want to be a leader a public leader you know in some ways i think there's so much good you can do i think one thing we learned is exactly that that the world is actually waiting for uh you know public spirited people to step up and do lots of things we have sort of now i think if this taught us anything it taught us that the world is you know very it's very important for public spirited people to step up to the plate much more important maybe that than we even imagined and so in a sense i think it's exciting to be young and to to be public spirited to be to to take the take your best impulse and run with it I think that's a that's a wonderful note to end on. So, uh, Abhijit, thank you, thank you so much for your insights, for uh, dealing with all of our questions with uh, uh, with such thought, uh, with uh, and and uh, uh, for your many very powerful messages. I mean, I think your message that when there's such huge uncertainty coming from such huge unknowns. Um, you know, we need to we need to be on the ball, and the best way of being on the ball is to delegate to the district level, delegate to the level where people are in direct direct contact with the people who need help, um, and fund those kinds of things generously to rely on NGOs. I think these are all wonderful messages. You know, to work on data so that we have some early warnings, uh, and to address uh, city issues and slum issues and so on by addressing the underlying issues of uh, uh, of of city density and how we create uh, a whole range of options for people uh, across all levels, uh, and I think your final message on reaffirming the public spirit—that's uh, a powerful message. Uh, we have many students who are on uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, video conference. Also, uh, I'm sure they will take that uh, that message very powerfully home. And uh, thank you. I, that's all that remains for me to say. Thank You're you for all kind. your time thank and your you wonderful all insight. For listening to me, and uh, hope you all stay well. Thank you, and to you as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good session.